Uh, so uh, having felt the same way many times, we'll try and get this over with quickly. Uh, so my name is Doug, and I work at Red Hat. Uh, I uh, work on the uh, CEPH storage system. Uh, and uh, quickly, as a, just as a disclaimer, uh, must be, uh, I, uh, uh, mostly what my job consists of is me write code, get push, grab a beer. Uh, so uh, I don't necessarily know what they put in the Red Hat product. Uh, sometime later they grab my commits and put them in versions and RPMs and all these other wonderful things that you've heard about today. So uh, I do know what Ceph can do, but I don't necessarily know what the uh, Red Hat product can do. Uh, for that, contact your sales, uh, your sales team. I have their phone number. Uh, so uh, just to give a high-level overview, uh, uh, first of all, I, I guess before I really get into the block diagram, uh, how many people here can spell Ceph? I gotta take it off the screen before I ask that question. Uh, and then, uh, how many people have, have used Ceph before? Uh, so we have a few people who've used it. Uh, and uh, I'd ask how many people hate it, but then everyone's hand would go up. Uh, so we'll skip that part. All right, uh, so that helps me kind of figure out what level of detail I should give. Uh, but So just to start with the overall uh, system architecture of Ceph, it's a, uh, a uh, distributed storage system. Uh, and I guess since some of you haven't heard of it, I'll, uh, I'll start from the beginning. Uh, so we're essentially a software-defined storage system where we store uh, data objects entirely using uh, software organization, using user space daemons. Uh, and uh, our uh, fundamental building block is the reliable autonom autonomic uh, data object system. Uh, and uh, essentially that's our software tooling uh, for storing objects on a distributed set of uh, devices. Um, I'll explain a little bit about how Rados works as we go forward. Uh, but essentially think about it as your uh, object store with pretty simple primitives sitting on top in an API uh, called libRados, which are basically just get object and put object, right? There are some more complicated operations that you can do, uh, but for the purposes of understanding Ceph, uh, just think of it as load and store objects by name. So you can think of Ceph as just a gigantic object store uh, that has, uh, that maps data objects, uh, maps data objects names to the data inside the object. Uh, because not everyone likes uh, accessing their storage programmatically, some people just like to type these convenient commands, uh, we ship uh, along with the object store uh, three primary methods of access that can all be used concurrently or they can be used individually uh, on the same object store. Uh, so uh, we'll get into each of these in detail, but the, uh, the first and, and perhaps most commonly used as I see it in the field is the Rados Gateway, which is an implementation of Amazon S3 uh, and uh, Swift uh, object storage protocols. So if you want to do essentially straight uh, direct object storage, uh, you can use the Rados gateway daemon to do this. Uh, and it's just a, uh, uh, the gateway daemon is just uh, an extra user space process uh, that handles incoming requests and translates them into uh, libRados requests. Uh, we also ship a block device. Uh, so if you just want to uh, mount up your Ceph uh, storage as, uh, as a volume, a lot of people use this for uh, things like virtual machine provisioning. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can make a block device on your Ceph cluster pretty trivially. Uh, you actually don't even need an extra uh, daemon to do that. Uh, and RBD has a bunch of nice features like uh, you can make uh, copy on write clones uh, of your volume so you can save storage in the case of uh, that uh, virtual machine implementation I mentioned, for example. Uh, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of projects like uh, OpenStack and uh, even a bunch of, uh, of Kubernetes projects have uh, interfaces on top of RBD uh, to even uh, hide Ceph from you entirely. Uh, and finally, we, uh, you can access it using a, po a POSIX file system. Now, the, uh, the POSIX file system does require you to run a metadata server, uh, but as you'll see in a minute, otherwise, there's no metadata server required in Ceph at all. Uh, clients talk directly to uh, the storage to uh, load and store data. Uh, so we'll get into each of these, uh, but uh, first a little bit about how uh, our system is architected. Uh, so you can think of each of these uh, creatively uh, drawn square blocks as a storage node, uh, and uh, each uh, red block here is a disk. Uh, in this diagram, each node is depicted as having a single disk. Uh, obviously, that's very uncommon, but I have seen it deployed that way with like ARM microservices and such. Uh, but most deployments I see obviously use multiple storage devices per node. Uh, in that case, uh, you'll just run multiple copies of the object storage daemon. Uh, so uh, sitting on top of uh, your uh, disk devices, uh, formerly was a file system, but you'll see there's an asterisk there. Uh, uh, and I'll explain uh, what we've done recently. Uh, 
to uh, remove the file system layer uh, from the equation, and that saved us a lot of pain. Uh, and uh, on top of that runs a user space daemon, the object storage daemon. Uh, the object storage daemons are essentially the storage targets in Ceph. You can think of them uh, loosely uh, as buckets that hold objects. Uh, but we'll uh, talk in detail about how uh, that's a, a, an oversimplification. Uh, question so far about the architecture. Oh yeah, what's the M? I forgot to answer that question, thank you for asking. The, uh, uh, the M is a, a system monitor. Uh, so it's another user space daemon that's in charge of maintaining an authoritative cluster state. Uh, so there, the reason there are three in, uh, in this image is because that's the minimum number we recommend that you run. Uh, they collectively maintain a Paxos store, uh, which contains the current state of affairs in Ceph. So, uh, for example, if you have uh, changes to your architecture because of uh, failures or additions uh, or administrative changes, uh, the current authoritative state is maintained by the monitors. Uh, and the monitors and OSDs simply gossip about the current state of the system. Uh, if you attempt to perform an action based on a, an outdated view of the system, uh, you'll be told by the next process to notice to contact a monitor and get the most up-to-date mapping. All right, so uh, remember I put that asterisk on the, uh, uh, on the uh, file system box in the previous slide. Uh, that's because we decided, uh, we had originally implemented Ceph on top of XFS, and XFS was giving us fit, and so we decided to get rid of it. Uh, we had originally called this new store, but we didn't really think that that would make a lot of sense. Uh, so then we called it block store, because it is co uh, consumption of direct block storage. So that makes sense, so we wanted to combine them. But that came up with B-L-E-W blue store, and we didn't really want to advertise ourselves that way. Uh, so then we switched to the color. This, by the way, is the first name in the history of the Ceph project. We are obsessed with cephalopods in Ceph. This is the first name for anything in Ceph that is not the name of a cephalopod. Uh, even our testing setup is named Toothology, which is the study of cephalopods. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're dorks. Uh, so, uh, and the, the file store, the XFS backend, was originally intended for hacking and development. Uh, and it ended up going into production. Who's done that before? Uh, and uh, we got stuck with it as technical debt for years. Uh, and uh, so essentially what we were doing is our, uh, our placement groups, which I'll explain in a little bit, were uh, represented by a single directory on disk. Uh, and then objects were just disk files, right? That's obviously how you would do it. Uh, and uh, so in order to find an object, uh, you would uh, traverse the, uh, the backing directory store uh, based on the hash of the object that you wanted to find uh, and go see uh, if an object by that name existed in the, in the uh, appropriate directory. Now, uh, as uh, we intend for Ceph to be a scalable system, we intend for you to be able to store millions or billions of objects. Uh, and in this case, <laughs> when you read a directory from a POSIX file system, you get the results in an undefined order. So if we, uh, just finding out whether or not the system contained an object uh, could require uh, pretty uh, perverse amounts of disk I.O. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, and then the other problem is we, we support snapshots and uh, atomic operations natively. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, file systems are just not really good at doing that. Uh, that's really not what they're designed for. And so uh, we ended up having to implement a full journal of all operations, including I.O., on top of the file system. So essentially, we wrote everything twice. Uh, and uh, that turns out that's not good for performance. Uh, I recommend writing things once. Uh, it really uh, tends to help. It only took us uh, five years to figure that out. Uh, so as a result, we uh, implemented uh, Blue Store, and so we just consume your block device. Uh, and essentially, all we do uh, is we uh, throw, uh, we create just enough of a file system to put RocksDB on top, uh, and we run everything out of RocksDB. So it essentially serves as our as the local uh, object directory, uh, just key value pairs, right? Uh, you can also uh, we also maintain sort of the the data layout in RocksDB, so each uh, each O node, each uh, object representation uh, contains a bitmap which, de which uh, describes where on disk you're gonna find this object since there's no files anymore. Uh, and uh, then to guarantee transaction atomicity, uh, we can use the atomicity of the database. So we don't have to uh, double write anything anymore. Uh, and uh, we also use uh, RocksDB as, uh, to perform write ahead logging uh, for performance optimization. Uh, so it's a lot faster as it turns out uh, and uh, you can also, if you have a, a faster device, 
you can put your, uh, you can put the RocksDB portion on like an SSD with the backing object stored on a spinning disk. Uh, and we see this a lot in the field. It, impro it improves performance greatly. Essentially what you've done is used your uh, SSD as a metadata device and your spinning disk as a data device. Uh, and if you're looking to implement Ceph, we highly recommend it. It's probably the uh, simplest performance optimization you can make in a Ceph deployment. Uh, the, uh, uh, right now we're ex we've been experimenting with different ways to more efficiently allocate disk space for objects. Uh, the very first allocator was actually named Stupid Allocator. It's still in the code. Uh, but uh, before, the, uh, before we released, we switched to uh, a hierarchical bitmap allocator. So uh, it's just a, a tree with uh, a bits set based on the extents we allocate. It's pretty simple. Uh, and uh, guess what? If we want to determine, for example, whether uh, or not we have an object, go look it up in the database and see if, there's a key, see if that key exists. Much faster. Uh, so this is kind of uh, what the overall system looks like. I probably should have displayed this slide instead of uh, the last one while I was given this overview. Uh, but essentially, uh, this, uh, uh, this blue FS here is just enough to support RocksDB. Whoops. Uh, and uh, you can use multiple block devices to back a single uh, blue store device. I wouldn't do that. You can just uh, create multiple different blue store volumes, uh, and that's more efficient. Uh, there's, also, uh, uh, there's also a filter layer that can be used in the middle. So uh, right now we support transparent compression, uh, but there are uh, other pluggable modules that one might write. Uh, for example, encryption or, or other, types of, uh, other types of filters like that. Uh, and then on top of this, we uh, implement our, our previous object store model. So it's completely uh, agnostic to the user. Uh, so the user doesn't know uh, whether they're accessing a blue store or a file store volume. In fact, the OSD device doesn't even know, and you can have a, uh, if you, uh, really hate yourself, you can deploy a cluster that has both Blue Store and uh, our old XFS file store uh, uh, OSDs on it. We only do that when we uh, you know, want to uh, destructively test our systems uh, and make sure that upgrades work smoothly, which they do. Well, they, take, they can take a long time. Okay, uh, so the, uh, the basis for our object store uh, is this uh, API that I said, just think about it as, as essentially loads and store, loads and stores. Uh, but uh, a, few, uh, a few other capabilities include snapshots. Uh, so uh, you can create a copy on write snapshot of any object. Uh, you, can, uh, you can lock objects, although uh, we, uh, you can also unlock objects. So locking objects protects you from misuse, but not nefarious abuse, right? Uh, because locking an object and unlocking an object require the same permissions. Uh, you can also use uh, the atomicity of Ceph as sort of a, a free message passing layer. Uh, so a Ceph client can, ask, can be asked to be notified, or uh, can ask to watch an object and be notified whenever uh, another client sends a signal on that object. Uh, and so we use that for some administration purposes, for example, if you have a, uh, if you have a virtual machine process which uh, has uh, a, a Rados block device open, right? So it's, uh, it's currently using this volume as its backing store. Uh, then it will watch uh, a particular key object in the, uh, in the RADO system, uh, and any other process attempting to open it up will issue a notification on that object so that the two processes can work out who actually gets to, ex to, uh, who actually gets to access the disk. Uh, so it's one of the ways that we prevent collisions. Uh, we also uh, have... Uh, each uh, object in Ceph can have a key value store associated with it. Uh, so this is something that's often used for uh, users that want to store metadata along with their data. Uh, so this is used in, uh, in for example, uh, the S3 implementation to store metadata about your buckets. Uh, it's also used in CephFS to store information about directories, what files exist in a directory. Uh, but it can be used for anything with the API, it's exposed. Uh, and we also have what are called object classes, which are just stored procedures that you can add to the system. Uh, so it's sort of a, a pluggable operation, if you will. Uh, and a few people have written uh, statistics and accounting procedures that, are, uh, uh, that we've added to the code base. Uh, so uh, we're very strongly consistent. Uh, and in fact, consistency is uh, really our, our first and only job. Uh, and so we compromise on everything to get, to, uh, get good consistency, including performance in many cases. Uh, so uh, I'll explain how we avoid our... Uh, uh, having a metadata server uh, using Crush. Uh, that's coming up in a couple of slides, so I won't cover that here. Uh, and, uh, but it does mean that the data path uh, 
uh, has uh, no interruptions in it for lookups or things like that. If you run CephFS, you do need a metadata server. Uh, and we ship with one that allows you to essentially translate file names to object requests. Uh, but you really only need to contact the metadata server if you want to do something, if you want to change a file's metadata. If you just want to access the file, read or write to it. It's not necessary to contact the metadata server at all. And so you can, uh, the clients and, uh, and servers can speak directly. Uh, and uh, what's uh, most interesting about, uh, uh, about Rados really is uh, that uh, the hash function we use to store data is dynamic and it's topology aware. Uh, so you can arrange for data to be stored uh, in uh, a topology aware way. For example, if you have uh, disks that are stored uh, in different servers or different racks or different data centers, uh, you can ensure that uh, redundant object copies or erasure code shards uh, are uh, placed in different failure domains uh, to uh, avoid system failure even if you lose uh, a lot of storage. Uh, and uh, we handle all that in software, so whenever there are topology changes, uh, the system just rebalances itself. Uh, all right, so uh, like I mentioned, we avoid a single metadata server by uh, using a really fancy hash function. Uh, and uh, that's called CRUSH, uh, Controlled Replication Under Scalable Hashing. Uh, and uh, so when, we, uh, uh, you, when you create a storage pool with Ceph, you provide a rule set that describes how you would like the objects to be stored. Uh, by default, we, uh, we replicate all of the objects. Uh, we prefer to use three-way replication, but obviously that's storage expensive. Uh, but then at least if you have a copy that disagrees with other copies, uh, you have a two-to-one overruling. Uh, the hash function is repeatable and deterministic, so if you want to find an object, you hash its name, uh, and uh, as an output, you'll get a placement group, uh, which then maps on to one of the OSBs. Uh, so that's why you don't need a metadata server. Uh, and like I said, uh, the, uh, the mapping that you provide uh, is, uh, is how you instruct the system uh, what your failure domains are. Uh, or you can also map if you have some fast and some slow storage. You can provide a mapping that stores some of your uh, data on fast storage, some on slow storage. Also, if you uh, are uh, one of those really scary, scary uh, setups that has a lot of different storage devices in it of different ages and of different sizes, you can specify weights on the hash function to make sure that your, that your device fullness is relatively uniform over your entire system. Uh, and... Uh, Essentially what happens when the topology changes, when there's a failure or you add storage, uh, all that happens is that these rules are recalculated and then the data moves to where uh, the hash function says it should belong. Uh, and if you uh, make a request based on an outdated crush map, uh, the receiving node will either have the data because this crush map is, is also outdated and serve it to you, uh, or the data will have moved, in which case it will the node you contacted will provide you with the latest map. Uh, or if you get really frustrated, you can just ask the monitor, which uh, always has an authoritative copy of the latest map. So essentially, after we run this hash function, our hash buckets, instead of being the OSDs themselves, uh, are what are called placement groups. Uh, and placement groups are really just uh, so that our hash function works more efficiently, uh, because we can have hundreds of placement groups, and that way you can, uh, things will actually work if you have like a three node cluster. Uh, it's pretty, uh, if you have a three node cluster and you want uh, each node to be 33% full, good luck that, uh, with the hash function being good enough to uh, land e uh, evenly on all those nodes. So you can think of placement groups as just uh, uh, hash buckets which are round robin on top of the cluster. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, going back to talking about uh, the individual ways that you can use Ceph, like I said, one of the most uh, common deployments is the Rados gateway. Uh, and what happens here is uh, you, uh, you've got your uh, Ceph cluster here, your Rados cluster. Uh, these buttons are too tightly coupled. Uh, and uh, so you'll run uh, an edge server, uh, which uh, has a Rados client on it, uh, running the user space Rados gateway application. A lot of people will run like HA proxy in the middle or something like that to uh, form a highly, highly available service. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden you can access your Ceph cluster uh, using the, uh, the REST semantics. Uh, that S3 and Swift provide. Uh, again, I mentioned that there's a, uh, you can also uh, use this as a block device. Uh, in this case, uh, there really is no need for uh, any extra server uh, because the names of the objects you're looking for are just uh, made up of the concatenation of the device name and the offset from zero. So uh, each client can easily calculate the location of any object in the system. Uh, and uh, 
you can either, uh, in this case, we demonstrate a, uh, uh, like a, a VM type service uh, where the uh, hypervisor uses a, a, a Rados block device as a uh, backing store. Uh, or we also, whoops, used to be a separate slide. Uh, we also have a kernel module, uh, so you can just load the kernel module and then mount up uh, your, uh, uh, mount up your block device in the kernel uh, and put a file system on it or whatever you want to do with it. Uh, so uh, CephFS is kind of my jam. Uh, that's kind of how I got started and a part of the project I work on. So uh, I'll expound on it just a bit. Uh, and essentially, uh, when you run CephFS, you need a separate metadata server because uh, you need to handle things like permissions and, well, the existence of files, what files are in what directory, and so forth. Uh, and that, made it, that metadata uh, can't easily depend on just where the objects are stored. You can calculate the location of an object based on, a file, based on its file name, uh, but the, uh, uh, all that other metadata we need a metadata server for. Uh, and so, uh, and as I mentioned before, the metadata server isn't in the I.O. path. Uh, it's only in the, uh, the metadata operation path. Uh, so uh, essentially here, if, uh, if you want to start the, uh, if you want to start CephFS and you have an existing Ceph cluster, all you have to do is create a, a storage pool. Basically a storage pool is just uh, one set of rules of where to place some objects. You can have as many of those as you want. They're really just administrative divisions of your storage, right? So you might use one for uh, storing virtual machines uh, to say back a, a Cinder service. Uh, and uh, in this case, maybe you want to run uh, CephFS to back a Manila service. You'd probably use, uh, well, you would certainly use separate pools for that because you'd have, you would want to have different administrative rules, quotas, uh, and all those sorts of things for these different classes of storage. So storage pools allow you to uh, have, keep different storage with different rules on the same hardware in the same cluster. Uh, so create a pool for, uh, also your file system metadata, it turns out, uh, we also just store in Ceph. So uh, your, uh, your data is stored in Ceph, and so are your inodes. Uh, it's also advisable to create a separate pool for your inodes, uh, for your metadata. Uh, that way you can store that, for example, on SSDs while your data is stored on spinners or some slower storage. Uh, and uh, so if you create a pool for your, create one pool for your metadata, one for your data, that's all. Uh, then you can create a file system. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily do anything, uh, and in fact, if you, try, if you create a file system and you're not running any metadata servers, the cluster will yell at you uh, because you can't access your files without, metadata, without the metadata server. So then you just launch the metadata server. Uh, now, it doesn't matter where you run the metadata server as long as that server has access to the backing store, right? You can run on any server you want. Uh, and you can run more of them if you want. Uh, so the, uh, the metadata server is uh, essentially, uh, is natively clustered, and I'll get into a little bit of that. Uh, so again, uh, there's no, from Ceph's perspective, the fact that an object contains file system metadata doesn't really matter. Uh, it's completely agnostic to the, con to the uh, contents of your objects. So your, your metadata and your data are both stored as Ceph objects. That also gives us uh, essentially free, uh, free persistence uh, and reliability for our metadata. It also means that our metadata servers, although they contain state, that state can be reconstructed uh, in case any of them fails. Uh, and I'll get into more of that in a bit. Uh, and uh, so I, I think I mentioned most of this before. Uh, but uh, uh, another thing that's important is that uh, a f each file doesn't have to map to a single object. Uh, you can stripe your files across multiple storage devices. Uh, so, uh, and you can pick a different stripe size for uh, every directory in, in uh, Ceph if you want to, uh, just depending on what your performance requirements are. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, our directories are just uh, an empty object that's stored in Rados using the key value pair interface uh, to determine which files uh, are in which directory. Uh, so it's pretty simple, uh, and our inodes just live inside our dentries. We don't have like a separate uh, inode store or anything like that. We just store them uh, inside the dentry objects. Uh, so the metadata server uh, was originally designed to be clustered. Uh, so uh, you can run as many metadata servers as you like. Uh, probably not a good idea to run like hundreds of them or anything. Three or four is probably good. Uh, and uh, as of the Luminous release, we recommend this in production, and right now we're on Luminous Mimic Nautilus. Uh, so uh, we've been uh, stable with multiple metadata servers for a while. Uh, the, uh, uh, the metadata servers uh, are, are very aggressive uh, about uh, caching inodes uh, for performance. Uh, and, uh, but still, the, uh, the current state of the cache 
is distributed across the cluster in memory pin cache entries. Uh, so if there are failures, that state can be reconstructed. Uh, and any state that has to be discarded isn't known by any other nodes anyway. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, me the metadata servers journal all their updates uh, into the CFS metadata pool uh, for performance. Uh, and uh, the coherency protocol, the cache coherency uh, protocol, uh, requires the participation of all the clients uh, as well, uh, which is sort of necessary when you have a distributed file system like this. Um, and uh, we, have a, we also have capabilities in CFS, but really uh, what we mean by that is uh, there's, that's the implementation of our rule-based distributed lock manager, which again uh, is another uh, really uh, fun concurrency management that every uh, distributed file system or parallel file system has to do. Uh, let me tell you what, it's fun. It'll tie your brain in knots if you learn how to write one. Don't ever do that. Uh, and uh, so for example, if you want to read a file, you need certain capabilities, certain permissions, uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, uh, the Ceph monitors, which are in charge of maintaining the cluster state, also maintain uh, state for the CephFS metadata servers. So if, uh, if one of your metadata servers fails or dies, uh, the, uh, the monitors can spawn another one. Uh, or, well, or rather they wouldn't spawn another one, they would activate a standby. You can have hot spares. Uh, or in the case uh, that there is no standby but other metadata servers ex exist, it can notify them and transfer the metadata load to the remaining metadata servers. Uh, and again, because uh, all of the uh, actual commits uh, of data and metadata are performed by Ceph, uh, we really get uh, a lot of the concurrency and redundancy for free. Uh, we don't have to implement any of that in the file system layer, which is really nice. Uh, and again, the monitors uh, maintain the file system state, so if you create a new file system or uh, a new client joins and mounts a file system, the monitors keep track of all that. Uh, and uh, you can fence clients uh, if they're misbehaving uh, or if, they've, uh, if they're suspected to be frozen by adding them to the Ceph blacklist, uh, which is a, a Ceph level uh, feature rather than specifically implemented in the file system. Uh, the metadata servers dynamically rebalance the metadata tree amongst themselves uh, as they go. They're really not that good at it uh, yet. <laughs> uh, this is something that needs a lot of work. Uh, but essentially what happens is the metadata server maintains a heat map uh, of access to the metadata by clients, and the hottest directories are migrated to the coldest servers. Uh, and uh, this happens right now, I guess it's every 10 seconds, but we should change that. Uh, but essentially the uh, entire metadata server cluster uh, attempts to maintain a balanced load across uh, the entire system. Uh, and uh, it'll even split uh, and fragment directories, so if you have a large directory with millions of files, uh, it's uh, workload can be shared by several metadata servers. Uh, and uh, like I said, so far our balancing al algorithm isn't great, uh, and it runs into a lot of thrashing cases, so I'll explain a little bit about how you can work around that uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, I'm shooting at the screen to change my, uh, to change my slide, that's not how it works. Uh, all right, I mentioned this stuff. Uh, most important part is that our dynamic load balancer uh, allows for infinite scalability. Uh, which uh, you should never believe uh, when anyone ever says that. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, if you want to override the, uh, the dynamic load balancer, which generally speaking you should absolutely do, uh, you can uh, set an extended attribute on, uh, on any directory, and that, then that directory can be served by the MDS of your choice. Uh, so it's a good idea to uh, perform a sort of uh, static load balance at a high level uh, on your own when you make a deployment. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll make this unnecessary through wonderful software engineering in the future. And my next talk will be able to explain how wonderful our new load balancer is. Uh, it's probably going to be the talk after that. Uh, so uh, you can also add or remove MDSs dynamically uh, because the, uh, when you add a new MDS, uh, it simply comes up cold and, and uh, then uh, it, it takes very little heat to get some of the tree migrated to that new MDS, very simple. Uh, removing an MDS uh, causes rebalancing, uh, or if you crash an MDS, then the state has to be reconstructed from the state of clients. Uh, so uh, any Lustre people in here? Uh, it's recovery, uh, so uh, same thing, same process. Uh, and uh, we also now have uh, performance counters, uh, so you can take a look at uh, and determine which of your MDSs might be hot, uh, which directories uh, are really hot, and, uh, but you can't determine why the heck the MDS is sending that really uh, ping-ponging that hot directory around. 
uh, but at least it can help you do this. Uh, also, you can have a, a metadata server, rather than being an active part of the cluster, stand by uh, and watch the behavior of another MDS ready to jump in immediately. Uh, and what happens in that case is the, uh, the standby MDS follows the log of the active MDS, and so it reconstructs the state of the active MDS uh, live. Uh, and so in the event of the active MDS failure, uh, recovery isn't required. Uh, there's no need to reconstruct uh, all of the state that was known by the prior MDS uh, because the uh, standby MDS stores the state. Uh, and so uh, you know, just a couple of commands to enable that behavior. Uh, so uh, our stats are one of, the, uh, one of our neater features. Uh, so uh, R just stands for recursive in this case. Uh, we couldn't come up with a, uh, one of those neat GNU recursive algorithms for it, so we just called it R stats. Uh, but essentially what happens is, uh, you know how uh, normally the size of a directory is just the number, of, uh, uh, the number of blocks it takes up, which is normally just one, right? Uh, so we decided to lie about that and report the entire uh, amount of data stored underneath that directory instead. So when you ls a directory in Ceph, you don't have to do like a find to or, or a du to determine uh, how much data is in a directory, you can just ls the directory. Now we're lazy about updating that stuff. Uh, so uh, generally only on uh, uh, me metadata updates or the metadata update interval is that information up updated and propagated up the tree. Uh, so it's generally a few seconds old, uh, but uh, usually it's, it's good enough for a back of the envelope sort of calculation uh, if you wanna see uh, who your worst uh, data person is. Uh, Smooch here doesn't like uh, physics grad students. I don't like them either because they, uh, in my experience, they're like a gas. They expand to fill all available storage. Uh, and uh, so you can catch them uh, in the act with, uh, with our stats. Uh, Right, yes, so that would, right. So Lustre DU would be unnecessary in this, yeah, in this situation. That's a, uh, that's a batch process that uh, goes through and scans all of the, uh, goes through and scans all the data on a file system to do a disk usage report, it takes days. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, we're a little better at that. Uh, so just uh, various administrative stuff that you can do. You can kick people out uh, if you want. So if a client's misbehaving or uh, doing too much or not enough IO, you can kick them out. Uh, we have online repair tools, uh, so you can scrub the file system, which essentially uh, walks through and verifies the metadata consistency. Uh, and uh, for most benign metadata inconsistencies, we, we can just repair them live. Uh, but for other things, uh, we have disaster recovery tools. Uh, you can also uh, flush part of the metadata tree to the backing store, uh, which is useful in the case that you want to disable an MDS for a service or something like that. Uh, you can also uh, have read-only MDSs, uh, and uh, that can be useful, for example, if you uh, have a large read-only load uh, and you want to distribute it. Uh, and uh, th this uh, strangely named OSD map barrier is named after the relevant Ceph feature used to implement it, but, uh, but essentially what it says is uh, don't listen to any client that talks to you that doesn't have the latest cluster map. Why is that useful? Because if you, if you ban somebody from the cluster, uh, then the monitor will no longer send them any new cluster map updates because they're no longer authorized for connection. Uh, and so if they attempt operations uh, and they have an out-of-date map and this flag is set, you ignore them. Uh, so it's a, it's a fence, essentially, to uh, keep uh, blacklisted nodes out of your cluster. Uh, so uh, um, a mentor of mine once said, life's hard, wear a helmet. Uh, so we do have uh, on and offline recovery tools. Uh, I mentioned scrubbing. Uh, you can also scrub through the file system, and, and when you do, uh, it's possible that data is moving since this is a live tool. Uh, so you can place a tag on all of the files hit by the scrub so that you can tell what data has and has not been scrubbed. Uh, the scrub process just runs in the background. Uh, and uh, like I said, that'll, uh, it's basically your online uh, FSCK. Uh, but you can also offline, like if you have some real disaster and you really mess up your cluster, uh, or you have a, uh, like a chunk of a cluster uh, that, you know, for, I don't know, a meteor hit half the data center and you, have, uh, uh, and you have an incomplete reconstruction of your file system, you can extract the data directly with, uh, with recovery tools. Uh, and in many cases, uh, given all the data, for example, if you lose all of your metadata, given all the data, these tools can, can reconstruct the metadata uh, it'll be missing some things like, uh, you know, permissions and so forth. Uh, but uh, at least you'll be able to recover your uh, directory structure and so forth uh, and give meaning to the, the data on disk. Uh, 
so uh, I mentioned before that uh, when we, we typically prefer to replicate data across the cluster to avoid data loss. Uh, in Ceph, you can also uh, use erasure coding to avoid data loss instead of replication. So you save on storage, but a, a lot of times you take a performance hit. Uh, the erasure coding algorithm is pluggable. We typically use J erasure, which is pretty, uh, just a run of the mill er erasure coding algorithm. So if you want to run something like uh, RAID, uh, RAID uh, 6, which is 8 plus 2, you can, plug eight, uh, you can plug 8 plus 2 into that algorithm and you'll get uh, a 20 percent storage overhead uh, for uh, the ability to lose two devices. Uh, so that's obviously much better than a, a 3x uh, storage overhead, but performance is lower. Uh, and uh, now that's supported uh, with CephFS before you, uh, it only worked on replicated pools. Uh, and uh, we're uh, working on multi-threading the MDS a little bit better. Uh, right now it's uh, programmed ex uh, especially poorly. Uh, and each MDS has uh, one giant lock that uh, uh, prevents any, uh, any uh, operations from happening at the same time. Uh, so that kind of stinks. You can just run two of them, so uh, you can get some uh, cheap parallelism that way. Uh, but we're working on uh, finer grained locking instead of our one Python-like giant lock. Uh, and uh, we have snapshots mostly work now, uh, but do me a favor and don't like hard link any files after you take one. Uh, that is not a good idea yet, uh, and uh, if, especially if you have more than one MDS, uh, just don't do that. Uh, and uh, hard links are really hard. I wish we didn't support them. They really stink, uh, and uh, I don't really like POSIX for having them. All right, uh, questions. Uh, I'm uh, happy to take questions now. Uh, also, uh, before I do, I'll let you know that I have uh, a bunch of flyers with coupons for a free Ceph shirt. Uh, so come to Setries and get your free Ceph shirt. Uh, or if you don't want to come to Setries, that's uh, too bad for you. Send me an email, uh, and I'll reply with a code for a free shirt. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Uh, questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, well, so it's not that great compared to uh, something like Luster, which is designed entirely for performance, right? Yeah, uh, and so uh, what will happen depending on how you deploy CephFS? Uh, the, the question is how's performance, right? Uh, and uh, it depends a lot on how you deploy CephFS. If you deploy it carefully, uh, then you can get very good performance. Uh, however, as I've said before, we sacrifice everything, including performance, for durability. Uh, we assume that your underlying storage stinks. Uh, and probably doesn't work very well. Uh, so as a result, uh, our uh, data being randomly distributed, if you want to do like a, a really big hero run like they do in the supercomputers here, uh, and just blast out a file as fast as you can, uh, you're not going to get the same kind of performance as you would with something like Luster, which is designed to do that. Instead, you're more likely to get your aggregate average performance all the time, uh, simply because of the random distribution of the data. Uh, but we're no longer bottlenecked like we were a few years ago with extra journaling. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, in terms of what stripe size you should choose, big is the answer. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, I would think the bigger is the better up to, um, up to a dozen megabytes maybe or so. Uh, the default's four. Uh, other questions? Uh, my email address is, uh, yeah, there's a progress bar actually right here uh, that I just noticed. I didn't know it did that. Uh, there's my email address. Uh, and you can, uh, you can come up and grab a, a card from me if you like. I have those sorts of things. Other questions? Hearing none, we'll see you at Sutri's. Thanks everybody. Thank you all so much. If, uh, if you have follow-up questions for any of the speakers and you want to get hold of them, uh, come grab my business card and I can put you in touch with them later on. So. Uh.